All right, we're recording. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us for another uh, public discussion, anti-tech collective public discussion, where we, you know, try to uh, have a topic and have a little debate, uh, which we're doing today for the first time, and uh, it should be exciting. We're going to have uh, David here uh, debate against Marshall about uh, competing conceptions of revolution and anti-tech revolution. So. Uh, We'll uh, having a little discussion between the two of them, and and then uh, afterwards we'll have a Q and A session that everybody will be able to participate in, um, and yeah, so that's kind of the basic format. Um, thank you again for being here. Uh, you know, I, as I just said, the, this first section is going to be recorded. We're going to record the discussion between Marshall and David. Um, we're not going to record the Q&A session so people can feel a little more free to maybe share their opinions if they are worried about being recorded. Um, so yeah, the first section will be recorded. We'll post that on our YouTube and uh, our websites for people to watch later and for anyone that wasn't able to join us uh, at this time today. Um, uh, so yeah, there's that. Uh, please, uh, I would say just hold your questions for the Q&A session. We do have a chat, uh, obviously, that um, people can feel free to chat amongst themselves within, but I won't be um, listing or uh, marking questions until the Q&A section, just so Marshall and David can both have a chance to fully express their views and maybe answer any questions that uh, you would have like halfway through. Uh, a couple more people in. Uh, so yeah, and then lastly, uh, at the beginning here, if you haven't already, uh, we would uh, uh, appreciate, but it's not required to uh, fill out this little survey we have so that we can better stay in contact with you and you can stay better updated on future meetings of this sort that we'll have. Um, but we'll also continue to post them on the uh, on the website under the upcoming events page. But uh, so for every anyone that hasn't already filled that out and would like to, I'm posting the link in the chat right here. And so there's that. Um, so here's, uh, I'm gonna lay out kind of the timing uh, that, uh, you know, how we're going to time things out. And then uh, I'll give Marshall and David each a chance to introduce themselves, and then we'll uh, get right into it. Um, so uh, basically, they're each going to take about 10 minutes each to describe their initial positions. Uh, Dr. Skibrini is going to go first on that. And then uh, they'll take turns taking about 15 or 20 minutes each to cross-examine each other and to analyze each other's views and present objections, things like that. Uh, and then after some discussion uh, for about 15, 20 minutes, uh, they'll each take about um, 50, uh, five minutes each to wrap up, just like conclude their, their view or wrap up their case, so to speak. And then we'll move into the audience queues at Q&A and we'll keep track, we'll go in a line basically in, or in the order of uh, questions that are answered, in the order that they are asked. And uh, that'll go on as long as we need to. We can, uh, uh, we're, we can be here as long as we want, as long as you guys wanna discuss. Um, you know, uh, within a reasonable time, if, if you know one of our speakers has to go, then that's that's uh, the way it is. But we'll uh, go for a while. Um, okay. So, uh, and I also uh, for you know I'm going to be keeping time, so I'll give one minute warnings uh, for each of you uh, at, at the end of your uh, either initial positions or cross examining or what have you. Um, cool. But so uh, I guess we'll move into uh, you guys introducing each other. Uh, I, I don't know, David. Do you want to go first? Yeah, will do. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Griffin. Right, so I'm David Skrbina, professor of philosophy. Um, yeah, one of the founding members of our little anti-tech collective here. I've been writing, writing and teaching about philosophy of technology, critical writings against technology for many years. Um, I guess sort of my critical uh, thoughts and ideas kind of go back 30 or 35 years at this point. So quite a while, uh, even before anyone heard of Ted Kaczynski or a Unabomber. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm a long time uh, correspondent with Ted Kaczynski and uh, basically sort of defended his viewpoint, uh, his arguments uh, in many different forums uh, over the years. And uh, yeah. That's it for me, short introduction. Cool, Marshall, you wanna introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, my name is uh, Marshall Sharp. I, uh, I don't nearly have the pedigree and experience that Dr. Scribina does. Um, I've just uh, kind of, you know, I went through a period of time, you know, I, I studied philosophy. I've been studying philosophy in general for about nine years now in school and on my own. Um, 
and, uh, you know, particularly anti-tech philosophy for the last four years. Um, and, you know, I, I stumbled, you know, on this kind of philosophical journey, uh, you know, I stumbled on a couple of philosophers that helped me stumble on it upon a couple of philosophers that, that until I eventually reached uh, the, the ideas of uh, Ted Kaczynski. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, kind of grabbed those and, and ran with them and, uh, you know, delved into this, uh, this idea of, okay, what we're doing here is not sustainable. And, uh, you know, it needs to be stopped, you know, as far as uh, mass society and, and modern technological society. Um, so, uh, you know, that basically I, I'm, uh, you know, a member of a ATC as well. And, uh, you know, I, I just volunteered to, to try this, try this thing out. That's, that's about all I got. Thanks, Marshall. We appreciate uh, your willingness to come on and uh, participate. Um, Cool. So uh, I guess, uh, uh, Dr. Scribina, you're going to go first and you'll have uh, 10 minutes to present your initial position. Do you need uh, to share your screen or anything like that? Or are you just going to? No, I don't think so. I'll just, okay. I'll just gonna talk through it. Oh, okay, cool, cool. All right, then I will start the timer right now. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, okay. I mean, we set this up as a debate. I, I sort of hesitate there. It's not really an adversarial debate because, you know, we're all, at least all in this group here, we're all pretty much on the same page. It's a matter of question. It's a question of you know, uh, tactics and how to go about things and what alternatives we have and which maybe which alternatives might be more viable or more realistic or more successful than others. So I think that's kind of the, the, the framework for the debate. Um, so everybody I think is familiar with Kaczynski's general position uh, that we need to have a revolution against the technological system. Uh, he portrays it as basically a binary choice. Right, so there's the 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 one alternative, the one that pretty much everybody takes uh, in in the in the world, is is a question of reform. So they want to fix or revise the system and get rid of the bad 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 parts, keep the best parts, keep the good stuff, the things that supposedly we like. Um, just basically reform the technological system, keep it sort of as it more or less as it is, except maybe a little better, more efficient, safer, uh, but keep the system going. So that's the reform option. Um, Kaczynski argues pretty, pretty persuasively, I think, that that will not work because reform will only yield temporary short-term fixes at best. Uh, the system will continue to progress. Uh, things will get worse. Even if we solve a couple of problems now, much, much gr greater problems will arise down the road. So he, his conclusion is the only, the only viable solution is nothing to do with reform. It's a revolutionary action that has to end the system basically in its current form. So that's the general argument. He, he laid that out in the manifesto, which is uh, now uh, uh, yeah, 25, 30 years old itself, at least quite, quite, quite an old document at this, at this point. Um, but there was a, even at the time of the manifesto and then since in his, his current writings, uh, more recent writings, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity about what he means by revolution. He tries to outline some of the details. He says some things about what it's not. He gives some general characteristics, some general strategies, um, but still it's pretty, pretty vague about how this is supposed to happen and what we can actually do to try to undermine the structure of the existing system. And in my correspondences with him over, uh, over the years, um, I sort of debated with him. I, in my written letters to him, I, I sort of, you know, would defend maybe a kind of re reformist strategy or throw out some possibilities and say, what would you do about this? What would you do about that? To, just to kind of feel him out to try to, to see how much he really understands and what his actual views are about, about what a revolutionary approach might, might be. And I guess I kept, kept coming back to one part of the, the manifesto. So at the very beginning of his manifesto, in fact, in section four, he says, this is a very, uh, it's a new thing. This is a revolution against technology. It's not a political revolution. It's not like any revolution in history. It's something that's very different. And therefore it's very hard to anticipate what will happen or to predict how it's going to go. And, and Ted explicitly says, he says it may be violent or it may be nonviolent. It may be fast or it may be slow. It could take several decades. 
So he, he's very open as to how this might go, which is the right approach to take because we have no basis at all in history. This is a completely novel kind of event. Uh, we can maybe draw certain lessons from some kinds of uh, some aspects of history, but um, um, it's, it's pretty much an unprecedented situation that we're facing. So we're really covering a lot of new ground here when we're talking about rev revolution against a technological system. So my own approach uh, was to argue for, uh, well, I, I tended to agree. Let me just say this. I, I tended to agree with him in my writings with him and in my other writings uh, that we sort of do need to undermine the system as it, it exists today. And if, if basically we're scrapping or dissolving or undermining the existing system, that effectively counts as a revolution. The question is, you know, how can that happen and what's the best way, maybe what's the most benign way? I mean, we don't want to do this maliciously. It's not a, uh, presumably, it's not a malicious kind of revolution where you're trying to just cause damage and death and destruction. You're trying to just get rid of this technological system and get humanity to a more sustainable mode of existence. So this is really kind of what, what the debate such as it is between me and Ted and maybe between me and Marshall here today and other people, if they have questions and ideas, we're happy to hear about those. Um, so I have argued in my writings, so I've written about this, I've written in, in my book, The Metaphysics of Technology, which was published in 2015. And in an article that I published in a book in 2021, the, uh, the book was called Sustainability Beyond Technology. I wrote a chapter in that book. And I argued for something that I called creative reconstruction. So it was a kind of revolutionary, certainly radical, and I would say revolutionary strategy to really unwind the technological system. And the idea was that hopefully at some point, and I'm trying to be optimistic, at some point in the relatively near future, we'll be faced with probably a number of technological disasters. Some could be quite, quite uh, uh, traumatic for humanity. And the idea is that perhaps at some point in the relatively new future, we will realize that uh, this system is going uh, rapidly out of our control. The problems are getting worse. It could be the end of humanity. It could be the end of nature or the life on, life on this planet, as far as we know. So I suggested a, a, a process of, of stepping back from the brink on a slow and methodic basis. And I called that creative reconstruction. I said, well, look, we went from an unsustainable from let's say a relatively sustainable situation. And then we got into the industrial revolution and then we got access to fossil fuels and things started accelerating. And then we had power devices, then we had electronic machines and then we have nuclear processes, nuclear fuels and so forth. Um, and things rapidly have been accelerating ever since. So I said, well, look, if, if you want to have a sustainable society, if you want to get rid of the system in its current form, which is what a revolution is, um, we, we, can, we can, in theory, if we are wise and somewhat wise, somewhat intelligent beings, we should be able to back ourselves out of this mess. And I've argued for a, kind of a, an unwinding or reversal of the process that got us here. And I said, well, look, we, we started uh, relatively sustainable maybe in the, in the Middle Ages or the early Renaissance, relatively sustainable technologies. They were very simple technologies, but they provided a kind of society, a kind of functioning society, high quality of life, artistic expression, culture, and all those nice things that, that uh, at least some of us would say that are probably a good thing. Uh, but they weren't in an, on an unsustainable technological basis. So, um, in fact, I picked out uh, uh, a lot, I've argued for different dates, say roughly, um, you know, the year 1400, 1300, I've argued that time frame is probably a, a good time, a good era that if we could target something, that that might be a kind of a target to aim for, where you can sustain a high quality of life, high level of culture, but with very low scale technology. So I said, well, look, it's taken us, what, 500, 600 years to get from there to where we are today. So let's kind of take the process and let's just kind of run it backward. And that was, that was one model that I threw out there. Let's say, let's unwind things on a, on a gradual basis, gradually retracing our steps uh, only much faster because we don't have 600 or 700 or 800 years to, 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 uh, to do this because we probably won't survive that long at the current pace. 
So I threw out a number of 100 years. So I said, well, look, let's give ourselves 100 years, a century, to rewind our technological system back to how it was in, say, 1300 or 1200 or whatever, you know, relatively early uh, stages in the Renaissance, for example. So, so uh, I just threw out a rough roadmap, said, well, look, everything that's, that's, that's been uh, introduced over the last, say, seven or eight centuries, we need to take it out of circulation. Thank you. Take it out of circulation um, at roughly uh, seven or eight times as fast as we put it into circulation. So you would immediately start pulling things out, whatever prohibiting, banning these things, uh, to pull them out of circulation, just working yourselves backwards in time to unwind the system, working your way back through time as you move forward. So it's a reconstructive mode, moving forward at a relatively rapid clip, de de disassembling or deconstructing, if you will, these various technologies to get us back to a sustainable mode of existence in a hundred years, roughly speaking, uh, and, and, to, and to get to a level of say the, 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 the late middle ages, early Renaissance. That was one model that I threw out there that I think was a radical and I would call it a revolutionary approach because it is getting rid of the existing system, certainly, uh, but it's putting us on a basis that uh, probably is sustainable at least for a number of centuries and still allows for a high, relatively high level of, of, of culture and satisfaction of life. And I think that's probably a reasonable aim if we can in fact attain that. So that's the, that's the short version of, uh, of, of my case, what I've argued for in, in writing. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, and now Marshall, you will have 10 minutes to present your uh, initial position and I will start the timer uh, right now. All righty. Um, well, today I, I'm defending uh, Kaczynski's uh, position, which, which Dr. Skrbina, uh, you know, went over a little bit in his, in his introduction, you know, based on, you know, his, his personal history and whatnot with, with uh, that ideology. And uh, so, yeah, what, what uh, Kaczynski uh, advocates for is, is a more sudden uh, and, uh, you know, kind of approach that will uh, simultaneously uh, invoke the system to a state of collapse. Um, and this will be accomplished uh, by a uh, very small minority of, of the human population on earth. Uh, and it will be, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it will have to be worldwide and not quite simultaneous, but, but uh, much more rapid than uh, Dr. Scribina's proposal. Um, you know, um, it, it's basically based on the assumption that, you know, as time goes on, uh, you know, the, the system that, that uh, you know, most of us reside within, it, it's, uh, it's a self-propagating system that, that is always proliferating, always multiplying uh, based on a, you know, an auto it's almost autonomous. It's, it's, an, it's a natural, um, it's almost like a type of natural selection, the way the, the system and its parts, you know, reach out and creep its fingers and, and uh, you know, kind of suck the life out of, out of the earth. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's composed of intradependent subsystems, right? So um, they're all dependent on each other. The parts are all, uh, you know, the whole is dependent on all the parts. Um, so, uh, you know, as time goes on, uh, the system will become more and more interdependent, you know, as various technologies are developed, propagated within, integrated into, you know, the, the overarching world system. Um, you know, an example, uh, you know, is that, you know, technologies which, which begin as optional, the people end up being no longer optional. And, and that is also true for the system. Um, you know, uh, if we look at, you know, something like satellites, which they're not the most critical part of the system, you know, but uh, the first satellite was launched in 1957, right? Um, now there are uh, almost 7,000 satellites, probably more really. Um, and uh, especially like on the, the military side of things, um, that, that's a critical piece of infrastructure now. It's so satellites are no longer optional to the system itself. Um, <clears throat> so, um, 
as this increased uh, dependence occurs, um, it, it creates greater risk of, of uh, catastrophic breakdown of the system, um, you know, like a house of cards. Um, and and in, all, in all likelihood, it, it will collapse um, of its own accord. But, but it, you know, the, the point is that it's, it's doing damage now. And, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't think many people believe that, like, it could collapse tomorrow. I mean, it's, you know, there, there are many things within the realm of possibility, but it's, it's not it's overwhelmingly likely that, you know, the system will collapse tomorrow. Um, so, we're, you know, but it could, you know, here in a few decades, it could here in 30, 40, 50 years, you know, that, that's, that's not uh, totally out of the realm of possibility. Um, <clears throat> so what we have here is a situation where, Okay, this uh, this system is, is destroying the Earth currently, right now, as we speak, um, and uh, you know, eventually some some critical in piece of infrastructure will fall, and, and maybe you know it'll collapse on its own. Even if this doesn't happen, you know, there's going to be a, an adjustment period, which will be at the cost of long term human suffering. Uh, destruction of uh, extinction of species, um, loss of human freedom and dignity because the system will impose such strict restrictions on human behavior that that uh, you know the the outcome was going to be terrible uh, even if the system survives. Uh, so the so the best choice is is uh, you know as Kaczynski says based on this line of reasoning for. Uh, a group to initiate the collapse of the system voluntarily and, and sooner rather than later. Um, and he says the, the best and most efficient way to approach this uh, is, is for a very small majority to, to start this, uh, this revolution, however, whatever form it may take, um, and utilize a, like kind of a generalized plan of action to be ready for a critical juncture at which uh, you know, they say, okay, well, it's time for us to, to end this thing um, and, and sway it to, you know, a, a near simultaneous collapse, relatively speaking, um, worldwide. Um, this would cause modern technology to fall and, and then it would, you know, allow the earth to heal itself. Um, and, uh, you know, the people who are left would be prepared for it and, and would maybe, you know, see the, the folly of uh, you know the ways of of uh, the folly of technological progress, you know. Um, so this this is you know a mainly almost a purely utilitarian line of argument. Um, there would be a cost of great human suffering uh, over a very short period of time. However, um, the cost over time, uh, Kaczynski argues, and, and I, I would argue that uh, would be higher if, if the technological system is. Uh, permitted to proliferate, you know, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Kaczynski also points out that, that uh, reforming the system will not work um, because, you know, it essentially takes place on terms of the system, you know, uh, when you are engaging in reform, you're, you're engaging in compromise with the system. Um, there are, uh, you know, numerous examples of reform movements throughout history that have failed or made you know, a pathetic amount of progress. Um, you can see this in, in all different sorts of, you know, uh, movements of, of, of uh, you know, liberal or left uh, leaning types that they, they get little concessions from the system and then, you know, like slightly better minimum wage and then, oh, well, decades later, the minimum wage hasn't changed. You know, that that's just one example. Um, <clears throat> So not, not only, you know, it is a uh, reform, you know, inefficient and oftentimes, you know, the system can even just go back on its compromises because, you know, it's the most powerful, uh, you know, kind of global force there is. Um, uh, the, the system also, uh, Kaczynski writes about this in his essay, The System's Neatest Trick, in which essentially the system will, will co-opt um, reform movements um, because it it requires some kind of uh, social societal change um, that it, it needs to 
it needed anyways. Um, and it'll, it'll co-opt a reform movement that can help them enact that change. And then anything that goes wrong, you know, they can blame, the system can blame that movement. This happens automatically. It's not some like guys in a back room smoking cigars uh, deciding this, but it just kind of happens automatically part of the system. Um, and so, the, you know, um, and, and even if, you know, the, the co-opting of the system uh, with a reform movement is voided, you know, uh, reform is simply too slow. It, it requires too many people to organize, communicate, debate, plan, prepare, and execute just one relatively insignificant piece of reform. Um, so that's that's the that's the general idea, is that uh, it, it's got to be uh, got to be a little faster. It's it's got to happen sooner rather than later, and, and time is of the essence. That's that's kind of the gist of, of what uh, Kaczynski's saying. Uh, e even uh, e even if the uh, you know general outline is very vague, that that the, the point is that you know the conversation has to be had, and and, and uh, you know that's why there there are plenty of other people who are trying to make make it less vague is to like be ready for this critical moment and, and talk about this thing and, and uh, you know, it's essentially, you know, uh, build up a, a movement to, to say, hey, you know, we, we don't want this thing around anymore. Um, but yeah, that's that's the essence of that. Great. Thank you, Marshall. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to go back over. David, you'll have 15 minutes. Is that what you wanted to do about 15 minutes? to um reply or well right so we were going to do a little cross-examination section I, I guess it wasn't really clear if i was going to start cross-examining him or he was going to cross-examine me first but uh, i don't know if it if there's a preference or i guess i guess you go first since uh marshall just spoke so yeah we'll start with you and then yeah just uh, I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll i'll time i'll time out like 15 minutes and let you guys yeah, know sure uh Okay, right. So, so all right. So let's let's do a little critique of the the view. Marshall did a good job, I think, of outlining the basics of of Kaczynski's program, um, and hit hit a lot of good points. Um, but there's a lot of questions there about what what we what we do about it, what it actually means, right? because we're trying to deal with with reality here. We we really want to do. Everybody wants to have an impact. I think you want to do it in in the best way, the most effective way. And of course, as, as Marshall pointed out, right, sooner is better. Um, and I think we would all agree with that because I mean, the system's causing tremendous damage. It's wiping out species as we, as we speak. It's, it's uh, you know, it pressuring people all the time in, in ever greater ways. Um, so sooner is better, but still, you know, I, I, it's, it, that implies we have some luxury to sort of dictate what counts as sooner, what, you know, what counts as, as longer, you know, and, and like I said, even Ted himself mentioned, it could be a slow process. It could, could be a fast process. It could, it really could be either way. He doesn't really know. And, and a relatively slow process could be decades. I mean, this was sort of in his own, in his own view. So, um, so I don't know, I guess maybe, maybe Marshall sort of like one, one question is, you know, even if we might like it to be sooner or faster, I don't know that we're in a position to to do anything about that, right? I mean, is it? I guess that's the question: Is the strategy different if we think it's absolute crisis has to come down now, versus we have, you know, in my view, where I'm saying, well, look, we have some decades yet. Maybe if we start now, maybe we have 50 years or 100 years. That I think that would entail a different strategy than if we say we have to do what we have to do now immediately to to tackle the system. So. I guess maybe that's that's a question, Marshall. Right? How how how? I mean, if, how would those strategies vary if we thought it was more urgent versus less urgent? I think he's actually asking you, Marshall, if you want to if you wanted to. <laughs> See, I wasn't sure if we were doing like I wasn't sure either, but yeah, yeah, go ahead. We'll make it a discussion. No, I thought it would just be kind of well, that's kind of what I was right? sorry we didn't really make it clear, but just kind of a yeah. QA between you and me, right? So, cool, so cool. we can so I can sort of, you know, 
crit crit critically analyze your view, and then yeah. and then we'll, we'll go back the other way. So that's what so I was trying to think. The way I see it, right, uh, is that you know, um, I I tend to think you know, you know, we we yeah we both agree that that uh, sooner rather than later is better at least to get something started, right? Because but when I said you know um, immediately, you know, I, I would hope that everyone could charitably take that for to mean not oh well we could all just get together right now and go get rid of the system, you know, well, that's obviously ludicrous, um, you know, but, um, you know, like you said, a, a span of, of uh, decades to begin to prepare for, for you know, or, or even a few years to begin to prepare for something like this, um, you know, it isn't a reasonable amount of time. And, and it's kind of like, or it is a reasonable amount of time, you know, um, because I, I think, you know, that the earth's, a lot, all life on earth still has a few more decades to live at least, you know? Um, so, you know, the question is what, what do we do with that time? Right. How do we use it wisely? Um, and, you know, I, I tend to think that, that the preparations in general uh, would be much easier under Kaczynski's view uh, than it would under yours. Um, simply because of the amount of time and organization and planning and, and uh, you know, essentially generating a populist movement of, of a, a huge mass movement of, of people who will back this thing, this, this creative reconstruction thing, um, it would take, you know, it would take, I think, decades and decades and decades longer uh, to, to be, even begin the hundred year plan that, that you, you come up with than it would for you know, to collect a, 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 a man, amount of people orders of magnitude smaller um, than, you know, what it would requ require under your theory, um, such that, you know, the, the discrepancy in time, uh, essentially, like a smaller group could use decades to plan it and execute it with suddenness, whereas a, a large group, it would take more and more decades to plan it and implement it. And, and then after that, it takes a hundred years, you know what I mean? So I think there are more time constraints involved. Uh, right, with, so- with the okay. that Less realistic. Yeah, so, okay. I mean, there, there is an advantage. I would, I would grant you that, right? So, so, so Ted seemed to think that a smaller group, he talks about individuals or small groups, right? That's a famous phrase that he uses a lot. Um, and obviously, individuals and small groups can act more autonomously and, and faster than any social group that, that requires consensus or planning or whatever normal things that people do, right? So that, that's certainly true. Um, but of course, they have a, a less, um, well, I don't know, in, in some ways, they have more, more scope because maybe they're unregulated, but they also have maybe more challenges in front of them as, as individuals or small groups. So I guess that's kind of one question that I had on the, on the Kaczynski approach. We'll, we'll kind of get to mine in a minute. So I just want to kind of just focus on Ted's right for, for this, this little segment. Um, I mean, he does say, Ted does say that, it, that, we, that no action will be effective until the system is so weak of its own accord, like you mentioned. That it that it's sort of like you know I've talked about like a skyscraper that's sort of wobbling on a rocky you know rough foundation that's crumbling already right so it really has to be kind of this wobbling system already and then and then revolutionaries can come in and kind of start shaking it you know and pushing it and then maybe maybe we can accelerate the process and get the thing to collapse I think that's kind of that's kind of the picture that Ted has been painting for us uh, at least as far as I understand it. Um, so on the one hand, there is a little bit of a waiting time because I think Ted even says it right now is it's not the system is too strong right now. It's too stable. So now it is a kind of a waiting game already, even on Ted's view. He does say, right, there's this point in the manifesto where he says there's kind of two things that he recommends people do. He says, increase the stress on the system to try to make it wobble more, right, get it more wobbly and shaky. That's the first thing. Secondly, is to pr promote, uh, develop and promote an anti-tech ideology. So kind of sy systematic, what I simply really clear what, what that means, but some kind of systematic philosophical or detailed writings, presumably, about why technology, current, the current industrial technology is, is so, uh, so uh, 
uh, destructive, right? Maybe what an alternative vision of society might be a kind of maybe a more benign future, maybe kind of arguing for that case, trying to draw in other revolutionaries because you want to sort of build your revolutionary core. So I, I guess that's part of this waiting game, I think that, that, that Ted has in mind. So, so uh, I guess, I, I, I don't know. I mean, to, to me, that if, if, I, if I'm looking at Ted's view, his perspective, it's got to focus around those two things. Heighten the stress. So, okay, so what are we doing to heighten stresses? I guess we should all ask ourselves that. And secondly, are we really promoting an anti-tech ideology? I mean, in one sense, that's what this group is doing. This is what the anti-tech collective is doing. This is what I've done in my own writings. I've kind of argued against the technological system, tried to promote alternatives and explain why, it's, why it can't be reformed. So I've argued against reform myself. Um, but I always kind of felt like Ted's, Ted's view was just, just a little bit either too incomplete or too, too lacking in details or too uh, intractable maybe for, I don't know, for even for would-be revolutionaries. I mean, it's a, like I say, it's a little bit really hard to know how to, how to proceed. Um, so I, I know you don't like this idea of a, like a waiting game. And I, in my view, I don't think it is a waiting game. We'll get to that in a minute. But but even on Ted's view, it's kind it's kind of a waiting game, even as it is. So I don't know. What any any thoughts on that, Marshall? Well, well, I would say to a degree, under your your view, it would be a waiting game as well, right? Because you know, uh, I, I believe that you say that you know, in order for people to realize that you know, um, this idea of, of creative reconstruction needs to happen in order for for uh, popular appeal to be to be gained in, in the, the, you know the anti-tech line of thinking um, is that there, there are going to have to be some disasters I, I think you've mentioned in an interview that, that you know there's going to have to uh, uh, and, and in some writing that you know there's going to have to be people are going to have to witness terrible terrible things uh, on large scales um, you know the, which which is very similar to, to what Kaczynski is saying uh, about how there's going to have to be some critical moments um, where that wobble is going to happen. The, the difference is uh, under Kaczynski's line of thought. Okay, for for Kaczynski's uh, you know supporters, you know they might take that as an opportunity. Okay, the system's super weak. Let's do something to cause stress and make it wobbly, like you said. Whereas under you know proponents of your view might view it as Okay, well, hey, hey, everybody, look at that. That's the reason that we should get rid of this system. Um, so those are the two strategies. And but, but I, th I think you know the waiting game is, is you know is essentially the same with under both theories. Um, well, now, like, I, like I say, I'll, I'll, I'll defend mine in a minute. We'll get to when we do that section, I'll explain it. It's not really a waiting a game in my view, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of defend that in a minute. But, but, but still on Ted's view, if we're just, if we're talking about his view for, for, the, for the next few minutes, I mean, it feels like there's not a lot you can do, right? He wants to heighten stress on the system. He wants to build international linkages. He wants to support, you know, trade agreements and, and international treaties that link economies and currencies together because a very large interlinked system, granted, has, has a potential for a collective collapse. And that's, I think that's really one of Ted's points. Okay, that's a good idea. But what do we do? What do you and I do to, to foster global interconnection of large scale systems? I, I, I don't know. I, there's not a lot you and I can do, even if we consider ourselves, you know, radicals or revolutionaries. Yeah, we're, we're well, sort of at a loss. What, what can we do there, right? I think he argues that that's pretty much going to happen automatically anyways. You know, I, I think he, the, the basis of his idea is that, um, this interconnectedness of the system is going to happen uh, of its own accord. It's it's not going to be the revolutionaries don't have to make the the international treaties uh, because the the politicians who are you know cogs in the machine of the system do it for for the revolutionaries. But we do have to but we do have to heighten the stress. So what will we do? Yes. What will you well, what will you do? What will you do if you're defending Ted? What would you do to heighten the stress as an individual? Or here we are as a small group. What will we do to heighten the stress on the system? Well, um, there's very little I would do uh, personally, me, because, uh, you know, heightening social stress, you know, um, the, the activities involved are, uh, you know, somewhat could, could be somewhat dangerous and illegal. And I would never advocate for dangerous or illegal activity. 
No. Right. Well, let's, well, let's, well, we'll keep those separate, right? Presumably, there's a, presumably there are legal means to do what we we're talking, and there are mm -hmm. illegal ones. We don't want to talk about the illegal ones here. Even yeah. in the legal, even in the legal sphere, presumably there's something, I guess, in principle that we could do to heighten the stress. So that would be the question. Even within the legal bounds of normal laws, normal civic law, what could we do to heighten the stress on the system right now? Yeah. Well, well, well. I did want to say that I absolutely do not you know, uh, advocate for illegal activity, we don't know what other people are doing. So, so that is one, one good point that we, we don't know what other people are up to. Um, but, but the other thing is that, um, you know, in terms of what can you do in, in a legal sense, you know, um, it would be, it, it could take the form of, you know, there, there is a, there is an amount of, popular appeal that needs to be gained. Um, but but really much much of the work right now, if we're, if we're talking about the right now, much of the work really is doing things like this, having discussions amongst people and uh, you know fostering refinement of ideas um, because because I, you're, you're right, uh, you know Kaczynski's ideas are, are vague and generalized and, and very difficult to pin down. I think I think he does this on purpose uh, because he realizes that this is extremely complex situation and and uh, you don't know what specific situations might pop up which could wreck you know any more sp specific plan that a group of people had in mind. So um, you know, really, I think it, it fostering communication between people as time goes on and uh, talking about specific situations, talking about what's going on on the global and, and international and national scale, um, you know, and kind of pinpointing, okay, these areas, these areas are, are, are interesting. Um, well, I, I, would, I would agree, but to me, that comes under the heading of anti-tech ideology. So we're talking about ideas and we're promoting thinking and readings and you know helping people write and doing podcasts. I mean, that's all good stuff. But to me, that's part of the, that's the, that's the second item, right? The 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 anti-tech ideology that Ted calls for, and I, and I think we're doing that. We're doing what we can, and I think that's great, right? So that's but that's only one piece, right? So the, the question is, on the other piece, is there really anything we can do at all, as individuals or small groups legally, to heighten stress on the system, or is that point completely irrelevant? And Ted shouldn't even have brought it up because we because it's meaningless. That's the question, right? I, I think that there can be plans made for direct action, um, but there are like moments that that uh, need to be, um, you know, then the potential revolutionaries would have to wait for certain moments to invoke direct legal action um, in order to increase this social tension, and also it it, it could work it could work out as um a sense of like you know they could instigate mass protests about you know something tangentially related to the problem but you know the and the protests would cause social tension um you know in a legal legal protests of course a and you know then this could you know provide to them, you know, another justification that they could use to build their ideology. You know, it could work that they, yeah. they provide a little bit of legal social ten tension in, in some legal direct action, maybe even civil disobedience type ways, and then use that attention that they gain from those situations to promote their ideology and, that, and, and you know, so, kind of reverberate. Yeah. So, well, so here's one side. I don't know, Griffin, how much we got a couple of minutes left in this little segment. I, I was just, I was just letting you wrap up, but we're, we're yeah. about, yeah, okay. if you wanted to do that. So. Yeah. Let's just, just let me last one point and then I will switch over and I'll defend my view here. Um, but I'm thinking like COVID. All right. So I've argued that COVID is basically a technological disaster, right? From, from the origins being engineered in a lab spread around on high tech transportation systems, uh, high tech vaccine. I mean, that's kind of multiple aspects, right? It's 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 a technological problem. So I think if if we could highlight that fact, and a lot of people are really you know mad as hell because they lost relatives and family members over the COVID thing, if they could be made to see that that's a kind of a technological 
uh, problem at its root, I suppose that might be effective in, in raising the, the, the visibility of an anti-tech view. And I suppose you could say, well, that's going to heighten some kind of stress on the system because people are going to say, hey, this was a result of technology, advanced technology, you know, caused this thing to be what it is. And, and, you know, and we always looked at technology to solve the problems of technology and that never works as we know from history. So, I mean, to me, that's maybe, if I'm trying to think of one example, maybe that's an example. I don't know what you think, uh, Marshall, but that's one that comes to mind to, to me. Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, that's certainly one, one way as well. Um, I tend to think that, you know, the social stress thing, it, it is almost happening automatically as well. Now, now it's, of course, it's always better to heighten that a little bit, um, you know, and, you know, in your individual life, you, you can heighten social stress a little bit. Let, let's say uh, you have a somewhat important job, you know what I mean? You're, uh, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to slack off a job, call in sick today. And maybe something happens that, you know, a, a butterfly effect of a bunch of things that cause social stress happen in your own personal life. So, so I mean, th there are, things you can do that are technically legal in your own personal life that heighten social stress um, to, to that, to a degree, you know, that, that's irrelevant on, on the scale that we're talking about. Yeah. But, but the, you know, that's something as well. Um, but I, I generally believe that, that the whole heightening social stress thing uh, is more for the realm of uh, people and activities who, uh, you know, I don't know anything about and, and I don't necessarily condone what they do, so. Well, that's probably a good, good point for further discussion. Maybe we need to have an episode on that or, you know, somebody should do some writing like, what does this actually mean? What does it actually mean, this heightened stress thing, right? That would be actually a really kind of good discussion because there are a lot of different aspects of this thing, right? So that would be that would be good, but but I think Griffin, maybe just in the sake of time, let me let's switch over to kind of to kind of my 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 view, right? Yep, um, yeah, I'll start a timer right now. Yeah. So again, so creative re reconstruction. Again, the argument is to to give ourselves time because uh, I think it's it's uh, self understood that uh, uh, a slower revolution would be less catastrophically damaging, certainly to people, maybe also to nature than a fast revolution. So I guess that's sort of one thing, unless we're, like I say, unless we're deliberately being malicious here, there's probably no, uh, no uh, inherent advantage in causing more, more pain and suffering than necessary. Um, I've argued that we need to start right away. So to me, there's really no waiting. We need to start immediately backing out of things, starting with the most recent introduction of new technologies, right? So, so we have uh, what are the most recent major technologies that have been disruptive to to society? So I guess you could look at uh, you could talk about AI stuff, right? Artificial intelligence uh, uh, applications. You could talk about the internet. You could talk about social media. You could look at cell phones, uh, email, kind of those things, which are relatively recent. Those are in the last twenty five uh, years or so, right? Um, and that's kind of what I've argued. I say, well, look, take these most recent products and and realize, uh, you know, or make the case that these are, in fact, you know, sort of destructive things. They're not lending anything to the quality of life. In fact, they're they're accelerating the destruction of the quality of life. They're accelerating the destruction of the planet, um, and they're promoting such things as, uh, yeah, growing economies, growing populations, and so forth. So so the idea is to kind of back off sort of with the newest technologies first, again, working your way backwards, starting starting as soon as feasible. There's no really waiting. It's a question of how soon you could you could uh, begin the process. Maybe it's at an individual level. Maybe it starts with an individual level, then it's a group level, then it's a kind of a, you know, sort of a grassroots kind of thing. Maybe ultimately, ideally, at some point, it becomes, a, you know, governmental actions. Um, the question is, of course, I think for now, there'll be the individuals who think they can they can back themselves out of these technologies. And, and I think we can do that. We have relative relative autonomy in some sense, I think. It's still in, in our personal lives, um, probably less so in our work lives, some of you, right, depending on everybody's individual situation. Um, 
but but still, I mean, it's a process that has to start now. I think large scale action, like I say, probably will not happen until we see, you know, another two or three or whatever major technological catastrophes. Right? COVID was just like a shot over the bow. That was really, even though it seems like a big crisis, it was relatively minor in terms of death toll and all that kind of stuff. I really had relatively minor effect when you look at the whole planet. And I think what's going to take probably something far more impactful even than COVID, you know, probably even if it's just the next pandemic, which could be uh, could be a 10 times as deadly as, as COVID was. <clears throat> I mean, without without much difficulty. And not to mention we're facing things like, you know, potential nuclear war here with Russia and, uh, you know, who knows what's coming up with China and we've got, you know, drone attacks are assumed to be sort of growing by the day. So, I mean, all, all these kinds of scenarios could happen where it will be apparent, I think, to large, increasingly large numbers of people that you know, this this is uh, this is a dead end move, and we need to sort of back. My you know my image is backing away from the cliff, right? You're sort of staring over the precipice, and you need to, you need to you need to sort of you know back yourself off this cliff. And so we need to say, hey, look, these most recent technologies have been highly damaging. The do the documentation, the evidence is building how damaging these things are. Start backing your way out of these things if you have any pretense to being a rational society. Um, you know, if we don't, and I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of on the fence whether we even are or not. I mean, I write as an academic, like we are rational people. That's, that's the presumption about any, any academic writing is you're dealing with rational individuals. But if collectively, if we're not rational, then, there's, then there may be nothing that we can do. We just have to wait for a catastrophe to hit or, or try to accelerate the, the catastrophe. But well, I'm, I'm working on, yeah, I'm working on the presumption that people are rational. And I'm trying to lay out a rational plan. That was what, that was my goal. And and that's uh, that's kind of where I was going to start because maybe this would be the easiest one to get out of the way, um, and we might just have to say, well, neither of us really know. Is that you know, I'm I'm not convinced either that that uh, there's a there's a, enough of a degree of rationality in uh, our society or in in the human population in general uh, for for your plan to be feasible. Um, you know, uh, I think. It's a it's a noble view, you know what I mean. It, it's a it's a noble idea, um, uh, but uh, are we are we noble or are we ignoble as a, as a whole? You know, um, are we fifty one percent ignoble and forty nine percent noble? If, if that's the case, you know, then or a rational or irrational. If that's the case, then you know we might be screwed. Um, and, and that's you know that would be one of my critiques of your argument is that. You know, your plan involves a whole lot of cooperation among a whole lot of people, um, and that's not feasible. It doesn't seem feasible from multiple ways of looking at it, such as um, the time constraints involved, um, just the possibility of cooperation uh, in general. Um, and, and not only that, but it'd be way more visible to the system itself. Uh, which means, you know, the system would consider it more of a threat and therefore fight back harder and, and uh, you know, probably more, more efficiently because it would be able to, you know, even though uh, the, the ends, both ends of both ideas are, are revolutionary, the, the end being the overthrow of the technological system, the end of the technological system, um, you know the means uh, your your means are are reformist and, and that the, the, there could be some of those uh, the means to to those because it's slow and gradual and, and so the means to that end could be affected uh by some of the problems with reformism that, that Kaczynski brings up yeah well except i don't view it as reformist because it's replacing the system the end goal is to replace the system it's just over over a gradual process over over a scale of time versus a relatively rapid, uncontrolled, unplanned event, because that's really what we're talking about. If we really do a real collapse kind of scenario, which could happen anyway, right? no matter what we do, we could be facing a collapse scenario. So that's always a possibility that we have to keep in mind. But if we if we aim for that, and if we try to accelerate that, that's a completely chaotic and uncontrolled 
process, right? I mean, to me, it's like it's back to the sort of rotting building structure, this idea, right? If you got a rotting building and you got to bring it down, you can sort of blow it up at the base and just watch it, you know, crumble and pieces fly everywhere. Or you sort of go up with a crane and you kind of start taking it apart, you know, floor by floor. You see what I'm saying? Either way, you're getting rid of the building. You're right. You see what I'm saying? Either you kind of do it slowly and, you know, carefully piece by piece, or you just go, you blow it up and you watch the whole thing collapse. And then you just, you know, tear apart the rubble and you see what, you know, you go from there. So I guess, I mean, there's arguments kind of both ways. And, and, and like I said, I've, I've, uh, it's not, it's not obvious that there's anything wrong with, you know, just going up with a crate and kind of pulling the thing down piece by piece, floor by floor and working your way down until the system is gone, right? It's, it's not patching the thing up. That's not what I've argued for. It's getting rid of the system to a very low level technological infrastructure, which basically is completely replacing the current industrial, advanced industrial technological system. So uh, under any view that I've argued, that's, that's going to be gone. Um, the, the, the process is how do you how do you go about doing it in sort of the most intelligent way and that's to me that's kind of maybe one of the one of the the, the points of, of debate here right and I, I realize that there are sort of competing views on that yeah and so you know I wasn't I wasn't like accusing you of, of uh, that your idea was reformist in general just that the methodology you know it's, it's that there's got to be slow incremental change in order to deconstruct this thing. You know, most, most reformist movements are constructive rather than destructive. An example of maybe a destructive reformist movement would have been like the prohibition movement, you know. Um, so, so, so there, you know, that was a reformist movement that, you know, they ended up deconstructing, you know, the legality of, of alcoholic beverages in the United States in, in you know, the 1930s. Um, but, uh, and as you see that deconstructive reformist, uh, you know, methodology um, did succeed for a while, but but ultimately it, it did fail. Um, and and so you know, I w I wasn't necessarily you know like like saying that uh, you know the ends um, that that the end your ends was was uh, wrong or like a try to a patch up, but but that uh, the methodology poses problems um, yeah. and, and the system would pose pro problems to your methodology is, is kind of what I mean. There, there's, a, there's another advantage to my approach, if I could, and I've argued with Ted, even in writing our letters years ago, we were talking about this, you know, like what, what's the goal? What's the end state that you want, right? And Ted was very explicit in his writings to me. He wants to get back to basically a very primitive uh, nomadic hunter-gatherer kind of society, right? So he really wants to drive it down to really the base level of human existence. And I think that's what would happen if there was a massive large-scale collapse of industrial technology, you know, every, everything just, just you know, crashes rel relatively fast. I mean, you know, it could be like almost literally overnight. And, and then you're really back to immediately back to uh, a really chaotic situation, right? I mean, we could imagine, just say it happened in, in maybe not over, let's say it takes a month or whatever to, you know, the power goes down, distribution systems stop working, you have no, no way to get any fuel, you have no way to get food, you know, you're living wherever you're living. And, you know, in about, you know, two, two days, you're getting real hungry, you know, and you got to eat and you know, you're, you're working through your, your food supplies. And in a couple of weeks, you got no more food supplies and the stores are empty. And now you're go, you're going down out to the woods there to find something to eat. I mean, it's it's like we're talking like really fast, where you're thrust. All of us are thrust into a hunter gatherer uh, existence, right? And and uh, yeah, needless to say, that's going to be pretty chaotic, pretty catastrophic, and a lot of people are not going to make it. They won't survive that, you know, a month or or you know six months or a year. There'll be there'll be a lot of people gone if that happens. I guess the advantage of what I'm saying is if you want to disassemble the system sort of piece by piece, floor by floor, you know, you give people time to adjust, you're making progress in the right direction. And furthermore, uh, unlike when you blow up the building and it just comes all crashing down into a cloud of dust, if you're slowly disassembling the system, you have the option to, to stop the process at some point. So this is what I've argued. I said, well, look, let's deconstruct the system back to say the level of the year 1300. Okay, we've got relatively 
uh, you know, relatively simple technologies, but you can do lots of great things. I mean, just you can think about all the accomplishments of the Renaissance, it, just for comparison, um, using relatively simple technologies, non-powered technologies, no fossil fuels, none of those kind of nasty things. Um, so you can you can still you can in a sense you can stop the process at at a at a level of say culture or or, or, or social existence that you could not do under the kind of the rapid, destructive, kind of, you know, real uh, catastrophic collapse sort of scenario. So to me, that's an advantage on my side, on my case. I maybe I don't know if you see that as an advantage or maybe that's a disadvantage. I don't, I don't know what, you, what, you, what your view is. Ted, you know, Ted wants to bring it all the way down and, you know, maybe maybe that's just the right view to take. I, 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 I don't know, it's, it's kind of a really interesting question. Well, you know, I think that in certain areas of the world, very small pockets of the world, really, that very chaos that you describe would happen. And I, I was, I'm was i going to get into the ethics, uh, the ethical debate very briefly, a little bit after what I say. Um, but, you know, there, there would be, at the same time, pretty, pretty significant pockets of people who who would be prepared for this scenario and, and uh, who'd be able to grow their own food and, uh, you know, live a, a, a relatively high, you know, uh, high but, level but, of existence. But even, to, even today, farm, what farmers, they're not prepared to, to operate with no powered sources at all. We're talking manual and animals, right? I mean, that's, well, what farmers today are actually prepared to do that? I, I don't know any farmers, but I don't think it's very many that are prepared to do that. Uh, they they exist in the rural, rural areas that, because it, you know they they might use tools but uh, you know if they if they realize that oh well our tools are gone they'll still know how to tend to their garden you know what I mean they'll just they'll just use hand tools you know well, they'll they'll adapt and adjust um, but getting into the you know ethical situation that's really kind of I think what you're kind of pointing to uh, you know your, yours is you know, uh, Kaczynski's is, is more of a uh, you know pure utilitarian. Um, you know, the, the system is causing so much suffering, and, and if, it allow, if we allow it to go on, it's going to cause even more crazy amounts of suffering. Um, let's just get it all over with with one insane amount of suffering in one moment, and then there will be less from, from there on out uh, after things stabilize. Um, you know, and, and uh, I guess, you know, I'm defending Kaczynski's view, right? So, so yours is more of a combination of like deontological Kantian and utilitarian, you know, because, you know, it, it is, you know, you point out that it is kind of horrifying to, to think of, you know, that kind of sudden collapse of, of society and all the suffering that would involve. But I, I guess, uh, you know, my point with that would be that, uh, you know, it would take so long to, to, uh, enact what you're proposing. Um, the, the only way I could defend Kaczynski is, is to say that it would take so long to enact what you're proposing. Like, let's say it takes a hundred years to even prepare what you're pr proposing. Uh, the amount of suffering and, and degradation of human dignity and freedom and, and extinction of species and, and whatnot, and that hundred years of preparation before your plan is enacted or 50 years or whatever, uh, could possibly overwhelm that that one big collapse within you know let's say five or ten years um, and uh, you know Mark, I think uh, we're running out toward the end of this little session I don't know if you want to if you guys want to take each uh, five minutes and have like a final closing reply or uh, summarization of your view maybe something like that um, uh, I guess Marshall, since you were uh, wrapping up there, David, do you want to go first and uh, have a five minutes? Uh, yeah, I won't even take five minutes. I'll just, okay. I'll just kind of say, yeah, I mean, I, I understand, right? There are there are virtues to kind of both approaches. It's um, the, the situation is definitely urgent. You know, col ra a rapid collapse is obviously faster than any any alternative. So it has the virtue of uh, of you know at least. For protecting nature, that's the best approach, right? The, 
all nature wants is to get rid of the system get rid of these 8 billion people and get, get them off their off its back, right? That's what nature wants. And the sooner that happens, if that can happen tomorrow, then that's great for nature. So from, from, from the standpoint of the environment, yeah, there's no doubt, you know, rapid collapse uh, sooner, absolutely the sooner, the more catastrophic, the better. So, so that's, that's one thing to be said, and I acknowledge that point, right? Um, and it's simpler. I mean, rapid collapse, you know, it's, it's always easier to kind of destroy something than to, to you know, plan a, a, a strategy that takes, you know, decades or a century to, to, to play out. So it certainly has the, the virtue of kind of simplicity of, hey, this, the, there's only one, one mode of focus, and that's just, you know, you know, just collapsing the system by any means necessary. And, you know, and then we'll, we'll, then we'll just deal with what comes. Um, so yeah, I acknowledge that, right? Um, I guess you know, to me, that's it's just that there there's room in the debate still uh, to to look at other possible alternatives, at least to lay out the possibility. I mean, none of us are in a position to make any decisions on these things uh, apart from what we do as individuals. Um, but at least to, to to lay out the space of alternatives, and that's kind of if nothing else, I think that's that's kind of what I've tried to do is say, look, there are a range of possibilities under the heading of getting rid of industrial society. It's not all sort of crazy chaos, you know, bombs blowing up and planes crashing and everybody's, you know, slashing each other's throat trying to survive, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be that way. And there are alternatives. And, and that's what I was trying to lay out. There's a range of possibilities under the heading of getting rid of the system. And, and I think Ted did not appreciate that sufficiently. And that's what I tried to flesh out in, in my book and in the, in the chapter that I've talked about. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously it's not, it's not an open and shut case and there's arguments to be, be said for both sides. So I fully acknowledge that. Cool, and then uh, Marshall, I'll give you five minutes to have a closing statement. Yes, I, I, I suppose, I, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, the the ends to the, the end goal to both of these theories is is that you know the techno techno modern technology needs to go you know what i mean that that's the only way for um for really all life on earth to survive probably you know in the long run at, at least in in a dignified way um without preventing you know or and it would prevent at at least uh, monoculture, if not saving all life on earth, getting rid of the system. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I guess what I wanted to note is that, you know, through further, uh, engagements such as these, um, and, and further writings by, by individuals, people working, uh, diligently to develop it, you know, an anti-tech ideology, you know, you know, something approaching, you know, a, a strong combination uh, of these two theories is possible. I don't, I don't think they're completely irreconcilable. I don't want to say that. I just, I, I think a lot of this needs to be fleshed out. I think this was a good, a good place to flesh some of this out. And, uh, you know, I hope that this gave people some things to think about. Um, but, but, uh, you know, ultimately what we, what we face is that, uh, you know, something there needs to be some kind of um urgency sense of urgency in in what we're doing here because this it's it's all fun to you know talk and debate and and write and and uh you know this is you know enjoyable for a lot of people but but we got also got to keep in mind just just how serious this is i'm not saying anyone here isn't taking this seriously i'm, I'm just saying you know um there's you can kind of get disconnected in your head of always worrying about the different theories and not thinking about okay well what can I what are, like am I am I living this way am I am I um, you know trying to actually do something about it and I guess that's what I want to close with is that you know um, it's got to be diligent commit commitment uh, and focus and and I think probably most people on here are are uh, you know doing doing what they can. Um, but uh, it's it, it remains to be seen um, how how all this will play out. Um, but but the conversations need to keep being had, and, and uh, organization needs to happen. Uh, so I, I guess that's that's all I wanted to share. Great, 
thank you both for uh, participating in this and uh, hashing out some of these ideas. I think uh, we all found it very interesting and uh, lots to think about. And I'm sure lots of people have things that they want to say. Um, so we'll move into our Q&A section. Um, I